very nice discussion. And our first presenter is going to be Rob. Rob, could you introduce yourself instead of me speaking? Just sure. say a few words about yourself. As Sure, I'm uh, Rob Atkinson. I'm a sort of senior research engineer at the Open Geospatial Consortium. Uh, I also work in the, um, the private sector as well. I'll show a little bit of both um, uh, and how they relate. Uh, I'm uh, largely looking at the sort of uh, the broad issues of this improbability at a, uh, uh, a social scale. In particular, I'm interested in uh, the establishment of growing networks of capabilities, which means, I guess, looking at future proofing interoperability. So I'm not going to dive into any particular techniques here, though there'll be a few, or particular standards. I'm really going to talk more about the philosophy of how one goes about developing capabilities so they interoper other cap interoperate with other capabilities and in particular some of the methodologies we've been working on about how specifications can be written. Um, so I don't imagine any of you want to sign up to a standards organisation and spend five years developing a standard before you can continue your work and tell me who wants to spend five years before they can start. And no hands go up, that's great news, I'm in the right audience then. Um, but that's nevertheless typically what some set, you know, international standards, they take that sort of time. So the question is, well, how can we make things easier for people to engage with? How can we allow people to make things interoperable um, without having to eat the elephant in one bite? And if, you, um, if you've heard the expression, um, and had you eaten an elephant one bite at a time, you can't, you can't uh, uh, deal with every single aspect. So I'm just going to dive into some of that stuff, just to give us some clues around the way I think and the way the ODC research agenda is happening and where potentially there may be collaborations in future, if any of this stuff interests you, um, uh, or you can see how to apply it, then we can talk further. We're not going to go very deep in half an hour. This is a, a master's course before we start scratching the surface. Anyway, um, so just in the um, uh, the Open Geospatial Consortium is a international uh, industry consortium uh, that's a, uh, a standards development organisation uh, with liaisons to the International Standards Agency. The International Standards Agency Organisation, uh, World Wide Web Consortium, uh, IETF, um, the Internet Engineering Task Force, um, IEEE, as you, you name an acronym, there's a, a standard body related to it. Um, uh, but of course, we focus on uh, geospatial and, and, and temporal as well, spatial temporal information. So, uh, one thing you might come um, when you start talking to people looking at large scale things and infrastructure is using sort of the FAIR principles findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Flavor of the month around Europe the last few years. Um, anyway, just to dive in. So, one of the things which we're well known for is we uh, publish a suite of web services, web map service, web feature service, uh, web tile service, uh, web processing service, you know, uh, all those sort of things, which are sort of standardized uh, technologies, largely based on um, uh, XML payloads. Um, but we have moved to the next generation which we, with the OGC APIs, which are based on the Open API um, technology stack, which is very commonly used. There's millions of developers around the world using this. People build an API for application programming interfaces to deliver data to you know, web apps and things all over the place. Um, uh, and so we're looking to standardize some of the uh, spatial aspects. So we have the obvious things, maps, uh, and features, okay, there's a picture, there's there's a thing with some data, and common is some of the things which are common to multiple APIs. And on top of that, we can sort of build on top of things like, okay, right, well, let's look at records uh, as a type of feature with some you know, metadata about an object, processes, things that happen, coverages, and ways of looking at um, n-dimensional um, uh, you know, yeah. packaging of, uh, of data, you know, all sorts of things you'd expect. Um, and then there's 
further that there's ones for tiles and styles and um, the environmental data retrieval is a sort of full um, n-dimensional access. DGGS, which is a um, Riemann curve, mathematical space filling curve, a super fast thing. That's how you know, Uber does all its calculations about where things are, routing and networks, joining data together, moving features, 3D geo volumes, connected systems, which is more about um, uh, sensors and you know, a sensor on a robot arm moving on a space platform, you know, observing a train moving on Mars, whatever it is, you know, how all those frames of reference connect together. So you can sort of start to see that's what we do. But it's, you may also have heard this hype around this thing called the metaverse. And so you know, we have lots and lots of industry forums where people do things. And if we have access to a very wide community, so I guess one of the big things about um, the OGC, but also potentially about me being here uh, based in Wollongong, is that there is a pathway to an awful lot of uh, international um, uh, uh, community standards, et cetera. Um, I'm going to take, going to take notes, see how many of those you can remember at the end. Um, uh, so if we think about digital twins and my um, my title, even though I left a long title in there, was um, you know, is building blocks of digital twins. First of all, any number of people are selling digital twins as a system, but no single system is ever going to support um, all the different types of information you have. You just sort of send different APIs, different types of information, different types of processing. Um, uh, and if you did, you could never really maintain just a system. You could never upgrade it. You know, one, you could never, um, you're just going to get stuck with one technology and you're never going to be able to, to, to really upgrade it at the pace which you know, smart people like the people around this room will develop new science, new technique, new sensors, new data. Um, uh, so, so the first you know, proposition here is that digital twins must be thought of as systems of systems. And that means that people who are working on one aspect are going to struggle because system of systems there's a whole range of challenges around the nature of that problem, which you know, many, many aspects have to be interoperable. Um, and there are now hundreds of standards at play um, as soon as you start doing that. I mean, and the, the burden on trying to understand how to do your job well in this context is really poorly understood at this stage. So we're trying to think about how we can ease this burden. I won't say we're 100% there yet by any means. But that's the tenor of what I want to talk about, is simply think about how do we break a problem down into, into workable pieces. So one way we can look at breaking it down um, is uh, conceptually, and uh, we're not the only people doing this, for example, uh, so the European Union interoperability framework sort of breaks things down into four layers. So uh, the APIs we talked about in this bottom layer, technical interoperability, but you know, there's also legal, legal interoperability you guys probably come across um, you know, CC by licenses, you know, Creative Commons. Creative Commons means that you don't have to hire a team of lawyers to work out what you can do every time you do something. And so it increases the interoperability of your system. And it's not a technical thing, but it's a but it, you sort of see the role of standards and, and interoperability you know, things is to reduce that cost of doing business, time, effort, risk. Okay. Um, then you have organizational interoperability, which is things like, you know, is my system going to be running tomorrow? Now, what guarantee do I have? But uh, the one I specialize in is this semantic interoperability. Do we understand what the data actually means? So when I say a building has a certain height, what does that mean? Well, it turns out if you go to you know, uh, um, Catalonia in Spain, that height will be from the, uh, the ground level of the front door. Someone else will be from the bottom of the building, which could be an underground car park. Someone else will be the absolute above sea level. And what does height mean? If you want to build an automated system which can't distinguish between those things, good luck. I'm not flying a plane anywhere near where you've been involved. Yeah, so um, we've got this really, really complicated challenge in many, many aspects uh, and insufficient ways of understanding how to break it down. So let's start doing the first level. So if we think of these two application domains, you know, effectively, let's think of it maybe um, we've got something modeling um, uh, you know, effects of climate on, on vegetation, and someone else looking at uh, real estate prices and urban livability or whatever it is. And 
Now, these two domains we want to talk to each other. We want to see what effects street trees have on on um, on property prices. So we have to sort of draw this together. There may be some common stuff. Okay, there may be some um, uh, common recoveries which are in use, but often they're going to be different. And we're going to say, well, actually, you say this, we say that. But this is how they mean. This is what how they relate to each other. The schemas, the way we structure our data, they're likely to be different. Um, so we're going to have to have cross or schema mapping. So the typical uh, ETL, and of course, the, the metadata that describes the data, you've got to have to understand this. Again, there'll be some common elements, typically. You know, we've done a lot of work on these common elements of metadata, but the whole descriptive process is still not that standardized. Um, so every time you start connecting these things together, you have to navigate all these different nuances. It just dive down one more, one level. Let's just think about that you know, a data provider and a data consumer. Um, you know, so on the API level, the consumer needs to know where the access point is, you know, the web address of it. It needs to know what type of API it is. It needs to know how that API behaves. It needs, it needs to know how to structure a query to that API and it needs to understand what the parameter dimensions are. Um, by that, I mean, uh, if I need to if you have data which is available on uh, on a time basis, for example, uh, can I ask for it by by month, by year, instantaneously, uh, millisecond? I mean, I need to understand the dimensions, every aspect of every dimension of that data, and then to actually create um, uh, and understand and exchange data, the data model. We need to know how to structure that query. Um, we need to understand the structure of the data, and we need to understand what the contents of the data. You know? I, what are the recoveries um, that are used? And then, of course, we have the descriptive elements, which are the semantics. I need to know what each of the pieces of those data structures mean, and then I need to understand the, what the dimensions mean. Um, uh, then I need to understand the range. You know, you know, if you've only got data from 1975, it might not be that useful to me. Um, and then I, now I need to understand the semantics of the data content at, at a final level. So this is implicit. And everybody's doing this, and usually what happens is your project spends 85% of your time doing some one-off job or you know, putting your various strands of data together, researching, playing with the data, sorting all this sort of stuff out. And at the end of the day, you've done your job, and all that information, all that knowledge you've gained gets lost. It's not reusable. It may be in a paper somewhere. And that's where some of you guys playing with large language models and so forth, maybe you can start harvesting some of that information I'm pulling it out into machine-readable metadata that other people can use. So there's a thought I want to leave it with. I don't know how to do that, but I'm hoping one of you guys might. Um, so um, in terms of you know, how do we actually um, uh, approach these things, well, in the past, we've done a lot of work sort of starting with UML models where we sort of create a GML, which is an XML schema, and we automatically create what I call a model-driven architecture where the model then drives the implementation of the APIs. And you can do that for JSON, for uh, the JavaScript object notation. But we can also take a semantic model on the bottom left, and we can uh, look at concept hierarchies. We can look at things called shackle, shape constraint. And effectively, that's the schema view of the knowledge graph. But the beauty of what's happening is we now have a way of joining these things together. We have this thing called a JSON-LD context that allows us to bind the elements of the JSON schema to a semantic model. That's new. That's something which, even though standards have been around there for quite a while, is only really starting to hit the road. And one of the reasons is a bunch of technical challenges, which I shall now outline. But we think we've got some, um, some, uh, some uh, ways of dealing with this at scale. And the other thing is that um, often what happens is we actually profile general things for, for particular purposes. Uh, and I don't have a lot of time to go into that. But so the reason's a bit writing's a bit small on this. But one of the things you can do is you can look at sort of the data management pipelines, data lakes, um, observation um, data uh, collections, um, metadata, knowledge graphs of metadata, scientific workflows, generating data products or data marts as some of they call them, you know, generating the data from you know, your system of systems starting to be pulled together. We have a whole range of different type of information models on the left, conceptual models, um, uh, uh, logical models, transformation models, um, profiles, you know, often which are binding, you know, these are the recoveries or these you know, that I'm going to 
uh, using this particular thing, the transaction models, this is how I'm going to package the data. Okay, and so actually looking at building a knowledge base of how these models link together is one of my primary jobs in the OGC. It's not really there yet, but it's part of something which uh, um, we are hoping we'll be able to feed um, more scalable things. So if you look at system of system, typical integration activities sort of in the um, uh, sort of the problem there. Now we've basically got uh, joining our links, we've got ETL processes, we've got validation, we've got generating queries, uh, we've got harvesting data, all these sort of things typically have to understand one or more of those models. Previously, interoperability has been a big capital I, and we said, look, there's, there's, there's interoperability on the left-hand side. Not being able to break it down means that what happens is we end up with these five-year processes and these big massive monolithic standards that are really hard to digest, and then two people in similar domains produce two standards which may or may not be similar to each other, um, and that's really the tragedy. So how am I going for time? Okay. Um, so just to break it down um, uh, a little bit more, we can sort of look at um, uh, the semantic interoperability um, and uh, this, again, I've sold some slides from my work at Surround um, here, but basically using JSON, JSON-LD to create a semantic model uh, and linking in JSON, JSON-LD, um, uh, OWL semantic models, SCOS um, and Chapel. Uh, we can actually do an awful lot of that without breaking up any new technologies. It's really a matter of linking together a whole range of existing standards um, in a sort of consistent way. So the next thing to do is pay attention to the ability to profile things where, again, there's a lot of detail, and uh, this is another three-hour conversation, Just, but basically connecting a common set of standards to, um, to uh, a common set of constraints and vocabularies. Um, The way we've done um, uh, specifications in the past has been all these big, long, these big documents. But what happens um, is that no one really understands how those fit together. So one of the things we were looking at doing is saying, well, actually, if we had information which conformed to a whole range of different standards, how would we assemble it up into a knowledge graph? where the pieces are actually linked together, rather than having to know that you know, on page 36 of this document, it says that this is compatible with something on page 95 of another document over there. And that's kind of, that's the current state of play. We want to move it to a stage where the, the, the documentation space, your, your actual specifications, how things are supposed to work, actually becomes tractable, navigable, fair, findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable. So we're trying to do that for specifications. Break them down into small pieces so you don't have to eat the elephant at once, one bite. So we're moving from this issue where currently um, the, the, the tradition has been that these specifications and that, often quite huge, are done by sort of copy-paste modify. I pull a bit out of that, I pull a bit there, maybe I've said somewhere so I'm compatible. But you don't actually know, and the machine can't look at that and find out, are these the same or not? It's not that easy. Um, or that's too hard. And so people just invent their own. But we want to move to a situation where actually specifications are made out of building blocks which are linked and, um, uh, and profiled to say, well, listen, I'm going to use that building block um, and are reused. But the transparency of that is the key. That, that's the bit that um, we've been working on. And again, you don't have to uh, read the dots, but this is actually just a graph of the components. These are the, these are the application packages, if you like, inside the work I've just been doing for um, Intergovernmental Committee on Surveying and Mapping on the 3D Collateral Survey Data Exchange. At the top, now we've got the, in the blue, we've got the, the Collateral Survey Data Model, and it's made of pieces which are a uh, standardised way of looking at observations. Um, so we have survey observations and survey features. Underneath that, we've got the standardised observation model, standardised provenance model, standardised topology model. Um, all these things, all those pieces there are all reusable. And I'm going to show you the magic slide um, in a minute. So first of all, this thing will scale to lots and lots of stuff. We can pull in building blocks. All those coloured dots are registers of building blocks. And these are my little buckets of the Lego I'm going to use. I'm going to pull off the table, so I'm going to build it. Okay. But they're visible. I can see that I've used that one. So somebody else comes along. I oh, okay. I know how to understand your topology model. Great. 
I can use your thing because I understand and that's what you don't get in these big, big long documents, copy and pasted somewhere. So making this into an actual knowledge graph of how the specification works together um, comes out of it. Um, what we can do is we can then, instead of trying to eat the other in one bite, we can look at it bit by bit. We can test each of those things with unit tests and with best practices. Unit tests are designed to pass. Unit tests which are designed to fail. A failure test is critically important because it tells you if your tests are working. Um, so, um, uh, and then we can then combine the whole thing. Um, and but more importantly, you can sort of see on the, the the top we can we can start off with a whole bunch of standards. We don't have to reinvent every wheel. We can say, right, well, how much of the standards can we reuse? I mean, can we can test that. But we can also then say, well, we've, we've had to make something up. Let's test that in another project. Let's test that. Again, that's where being part of this broader international community uh, is helpful because we have lots of projects who need things. Um, and you know, in, in this particular case, we generated, I don't know, about 150 different test cases for Cadastro, all the things which the previous attempt at a fixed XML schema couldn't really handle. So all so so we put we got the surveyor generals of each of the states actually just that uh, and, and their um, their teams to actually throw us all the challenges and we actually tested this and we were able to very very rapidly develop and test and um, uh, a solution uh, that had, had, had spent ten years trying to make it work with a single XML schema and basically you know tens of millions of dollars and failed because it's just. Then, because they just try to eat the elephant in one bite. Anytime you fix a schema, you're trying to say, okay, I'm going to have build a spreadsheet which is going to cover all your needs for information from the rest from here to the end of the world. Now, how many columns are going to have? I don't know, 5,000? What's your chance of doing a reasonable job of that and it working tomorrow? Very, very limited. But there's almost certain there's going to be a piece in there. Okay, we have addresses. I've got my friends. I've got my recipes. I've got my. Now, you can break it down into pieces which quite likely you can use reusable patterns. And then this is the, this is the money slide. Again, it's a bit uh, small to read, but, um, but what this actually is showing is that when we are doing validation on examples to the Cadastral Survey data set, we're actually inheriting all the business rules, all the logic rules from all those things, all those building blocks. So you can sort of see the second level is features with topology. That checks that all the, all the topology um, constraints are correct. Now, you don't want to have to do that, reinvent that wheel every time. Uh, the third one down is survey observations. That checks to make sure that the observations and measurements model is, is correct, which could be quite complicated because you could have observation collections which say uh, what the observation procedure is, and then you have a, another collection nested to that, which is um, I'm, okay, I'm observing this table and that table and that table, and then have another level which is, okay, this is the... This is the um, the methodology by which I'm uh, measuring the quality of the surface. Uh, and, um, and then eventually you get down and then your, your individual observations at different times and at different places on the table. But somewhere in that chain, you've got to say all those things. When did you do it? How did you do it? What did you measure? Um, what the feature of interest is? So, but the, but the logic constraint models of working out that all those pieces of information are available somewhere in that collection, you can't just do that with schemas. It, no, it doesn't scale, but we can do that with the semantics. So this business of having mapped the schemas of semantics means we can then put these higher order business logic rules and we can get them right. They're a little bit complicated. And then there's all sorts of weird and wonderful inverse paths and so forth because there's multiple ways of expressing things. But the ontology experts can solve that once, get it working right, the standardized observation model. And I'm one of the co-authors of SOSA, the um, W3C, ODC, sort of observation ontology. Now we can get that stuff right once, and everybody else can reuse it. If every specification had to reuse, had to rebuild those tests, that would be a nightmare. But this transparency of yes, you're using that, yes, it's tested against that. Oh, I can see you're using that. I can trust it works. That changes the game. Um, I don't have to understand your entire specification, your entire system. I can see which parts I already know how to work with, and which parts I'm going to have to think about. So that's. That's, if you like, the building block in a, in a nutshell. There's other aspects of it in terms of future proofing, is that we can also do the work of saying, right, this works open API 3.0 today, how is it going to work for 3.1 tomorrow or you know, 4.0 in future? Now, all that stuff, we, these building blocks can be made, you know, we can do all the 
work of future-proofing them in one place so that everybody doesn't have to become an expert in understanding the evolution of the open API specification. I mean, that's that took me mm -hmm. in, I'd say, in sort of six months to unpack what all the challenges were. And we ended up with a, you know, um, with hiring some of the people from the JSON Schema and API, Open API communities to actually help us unpick what the, what that roadmap might look like. So, um, again, uh, there's, um, this is the last slide. Really. That's frankly, there are a bunch of resources there. There's a link there. I'll send this. And, and a, in that link to the building blocks documentation, you should be able to find access to all the, um, the technical resources. Um, again, just sort of, you know, the point is that these building blocks have multiple different aspects that a lot of different experts, a lot of different community groups are tested in many different places. Um, now they're basically a way of taking the texts that are currently in the, sitting in these specifications and making them accessible for reuse. So we've sort of put in that, that fair principle. And we're doing some work in built environment and so forth um, around um, uh, digital compliance checks for building permits. So there's, 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 there's any number of different activities. I couldn't really list them all. But lots of standards, lots of know-how available to discuss further how any of that might be useful as you think about how you yeah. attack problems. Yeah. Done. Okay. Thank you. Half a lot. Two questions we can take. Thank you. I have questions. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Thank you, Rob. This is this is really good. Uh, there is for this cadaster 3d cadaster work that you've done there is victorian profile and also new zealand profile and the wa1 at this stage. wa1 at this stage how do, do they fit to this the set of schemas that you have uh, the reason i'm asking is because we're doing it one for new south wales right and now so uh, just to get a bit of inside on that yeah so the profiles so i didn't again didn't go into many technical details but each building block repository is a github repository with automation so it's all open and you can see how it all works so effectively you can just clone one of those and say okay right i'm going to start putting my new south wales examples into it okay and then i'm going to start putting my new south wales vocabularies the, the vocabularies i use so now, when Victoria says it's a, um, no, the monument is a peg and someone else said it's a post, no, that's, these are the nuances. So we worked with the ICSM and we worked out where vocabularies could be standardised and where they were still different because their regulations still use different terminology. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so we have an ICSM vocabulary. Well, in fact, first of all, there's an ICSM vocabulary repository and, and everybody can basically... Um, there are a bunch of ICSM vocabularies. There are a bunch of WA, New Zealand, and um, Victorian vocabularies. And so you can add your New South Wales vocabularies to that. These are the terms which you need to use to put inside the data to meet the New South Wales regulatory requirements. Um, and then you can start testing um, uh, using the example test cases of these. So, right, let's put some New South Wales examples in there. Let's find uh, all those challenges and corner cases and um, and see how they work. But one of the things is you can test it you know, little bit by little bit. You can say, I'm just going to test to see whether my my description of a um, of a geodetic mark is going to fit. So you can, yeah. and then having tested lots and lots of pieces of these, these profiles, you get the recovery binding working for that piece. The point is that as you then start building bigger and bigger test cases you know, for more complete survey, you're just reusing that. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. So so it's a um, uh, you know, it's 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 not trivial how you tackle down a complex problem. Mm -hmm. But remember, this is the problem that completely broke land XML. So um, the the fact that we are going to have to do a new way of looking at it is not surprising, because the old ways didn't work. So I so I believe basically you can start incrementally testing. There is documentation. Hopefully, you've you've got access to that that talks about um, you know, the profiling mechanisms. Um, but generally speaking, what we found is that when we started putting all these different test cases through against the model, because we'd done a really good co-design process on the conceptual model as an ontology, um, we just started tweaking the schemas um, a little bit around the standard patterns that people use for these types of things. Um, 
we found that we basically didn't have any breaks. We added one or two attributes to the model at the end of a nine-month process of implementing this, going from a conceptual model to a, to a schema. There were just a few things that had to be broken down, you know, just into a couple of smaller pieces because the concept was easy, but it's hard to express it in a single scale value. So we had to create a little micro schema or some little pieces. But yeah, actually, we didn't actually need to change the model. So, which is kind of the purpose. We tested to see whether we could build a profile for each state for those three states. Mm -hmm. And basically, it, 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 um, it survived uh, engagement with the enemy very well. Um, and the process of making a change is that, well, if you do find something, then we can re run regression tests. You do want to say we need to make a change to the schema at the, at the core model, or we want to uh, the ICSM model. Like we've got a placeholder for ICSM address. Something else we need, we can add. Um, but if we do need to make any change to meet some requirement, it's very easy to do regression testings and all the other profiles. So, right, would everybody else's profile still work? I can basically just go in there and say, run, run the validation work there again and say, do all the examples still work for Western Australia? Okay, I haven't broken the schema, um, even though I've tweaked it to meet some new requirement. So that's kind of the process. Does that make sense? Yeah, we are, um, I mean, it's an honest project. So the students already compiled the spreadsheet of the vocabulary specific to New South Wales. I don't think that it will get into the next stage, which bring to bring into the uh, the profile format. But at this stage, it is basically looking at all different types of plans and vocabulary. But I think the next step is there yeah. would be yeah. I mean, that, yeah, that that that's very interesting. Where we get the coverage? Yeah. And um, okay, but I also suggest because now we saw quite a lot of examples and uh, yeah ideas from more geospatial side of that data. Uh, did you also consider something from the construction side? Um, well, this this methodology is actually independent of it's whether it's dependent. geospatial or yeah. any other. It's really. But did you have the um, type well, something with? Uh, uh, I look, I'm, we haven't done. Much. We did analyze when we built the 3D geometry model, the topology model. Yeah. That's the point at which we analyzed the construction and all the BIM and all that sort of stuff. We looked at the, we looked at all the uh, dozen or so different ways of handling 3D data around the world and tried to identify what was going on different. And we found that every single one of them was very weak on topology. Okay. Okay, and that's yeah. basically why we focus on developing a 3D topology model. Because with if you get the 3D topology model right, then you can use any range of different simple 3D geometry models. Um, that's not a problem. But yeah, so actually having the ability to specify and that this feature is the boundary between these two um, volumes. Okay. So well, that, that was that was missing across all those yeah, different standards. That's a very good point. We can discuss it after that. And I would suggest now we go to another presentation. Oh, uh, there's a bit, just got one question on the uh, on the chat. Uh, from Monica. Um, Ron, can you elaborate on what will be the expected AI role in enhancing semantic interoperability? There's an awful lot of people at the moment um, basically saying that uh, they believe that LLMs are knowledge graphs. Um, so I, I you know, this, this, you know, Google and lots of people are building semantic knowledge graphs for geospatial and exploring how AI uh, exploits these. Um, I'm also uh, working with Matt Buckham down at RMIT, who um, is also looking into this. Um, so I think the thing about AI is it's a statistical, um, uh, it's, it's a statistical process fundamentally guided by um, uh, uh, you know, being pushed into some sort of structural guidelines, that's what a language model is. And I think we will find there are implementation patterns like these building blocks where you could, I mean, I would say that if we have enough of these things out there in the wild being used, you can ask an AI, is that, build me a specification for this, reusing all the available building blocks and identify which new building blocks, and, you know, give me a draft of the three new building blocks I will need that you can't buy, you can't pull from the libraries. Think of it as software libraries, okay? 
99% of your code is going to be pulled in from software libraries. And then you write your own little bits which glue it together the way you want it to do. You might write your own little funky algorithm or something specific. Now, that AIs can do a great job already of writing software that exploits software libraries. So that, I think, is where the, um, uh, the, the potential highest value. But we're a long way from having enough information for AIs to exploit it in a structured fashion. There are, some, there are lots of intermediate goals. There are lots of things we can do um, in the short term. Um, and, and I'm particularly interested in, um, in the data processing pipelines. If we can capture training sets of provenance of what was used to generate what and, and what the spatial operations use, if you can get enough of that sort of training material, then AI should be able to unpick scientific papers and say, actually, this is what we think was done. This, we think that it was actually used to generate that data based on. So I think that's the sort of thing that AI um, can exploit LLMs for, um, LLMs in particular. Uh, but all these things come down to, can you give these things enough clues? Is there enough structure available? So we don't have to boil the ocean of interoperability, but maybe we do need to get some significant amount of um, exemplars that AI can actually exploit. My best guess. Mm. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So let's leave some thoughts for the discussion after the lunch, and now we can continue with the next presentation, and we find revealed by Jack on really very typical construction type of uh, problems. Let me share my screen first. Oh, we could put it on here. Uh, it is being uh, uh, Teams. Yeah. Teams, yeah. So the next two presenters, actually, they are all funded by this ARC Resilient and Intelligent Infrastructure System Research Hub. And uh, Jack is uh, just 